and momentum in recent years. So here's a brief outline. We'll just start by defining what deprescribing is, and then we'll move into a brief summary of some key resources, which I hope is kind of the main takeaway from today's mini didactic. Um, and these resources are rapidly expanding over time. And then at the end, we'll talk about this concept of how to become a deprescriber, um, which is kind of the opposite of how we were trained. We're trained to start things, um, not at all really to stop things. So to start, I want you to think about the visual that comes to mind when you think about the word polypharmacy. And oftentimes, I think as healthcare providers, our main visual when we think and speak about polypharmacy is the medication list in the EHR, which is a static thing that we can't really relate to. So I think it's important to constantly put ourselves in the patient's shoes with how their polypharmacy comes to life in their living setting. So I think with this visual in mind, we might have more of a motivation to intervene and, and deprescribe. So like I said, we'll start with the definition. It's a bit of a mouthful and there's a lot of components, but um, this article from Scott in 2015 defines it as a systematic process of identifying and discontinuing or reducing the dose of meds when existing or potential harms outweigh existing or potential benefits, and all of that is within the context of an individual patient's care goals, function, life expectancy, values, and preference, preferences. Now you can imagine that's really hard to do. It's hard to operationalize. It's hard to implement. Um, so there are definitely barriers and challenges, um, but it is doable. A more simple definition is kind of focusing on the actual act of deprescribing, which is the planned supervised dose reduction or stopping of a medication. So in terms of key resources that I mentioned, there is a relatively new chapter now and up to date on deprescribing that came out earlier this year. And I think it provides a really nice summary of this space. So if you are giving you know, your own mini didactic in your team, um, or kind of a huddle sort of presentation, this is a really good place to start on deprescribing. In addition, there are a variety of tools available from around the world, including a lot from Canada and Australia who have really led this effort. Um, here in the US, we of course have the beers criteria, which are a list of potentially inappropriate meds in older adults, um, but there are definitely more user-friendly, more clinically relevant, um, resources that are out there related to deprescribing. And I would just highly recommend that um, if you take away anything else, nothing else from today's talk, please go to deprescribing.org and just play around a little bit, see what's on there. Um, it's a tremendous um, compendium of resources for both patients and healthcare providers. It includes a lot of specific deprescribing algorithms for different medication classes, pamphlets for patients, decision aids, et cetera. So that's your only assignment is to go to deprescribing.org and see if there's something there that you can find that could be helpful for you. This is a screenshot of one example of a deprescribing algorithm, and this is for antihyperglycemics. So I think they've done a really nice job with the design. It's very user-friendly, they're evidence-based, um, and they're publicly available, so they're free, which is great. In the US, about a year ago now, the National Institute on Aging funded a deprescribing research network. And I've included the website here for you to go check out. Um, they have a really good newsletter that comes out once a month of all things deprescribing research in the US um, and around the world. So that would be something good to sign up for. And as you can imagine, given the name, the focus of this network is on generating and disseminating research related to deprescribing. Um, and so in addition to that, they provide a lot of opportunities for kind of shared learning and collaboration. And they just had their first annual meeting um, just a couple of weeks ago or last week, I can't remember. Um, but typically in normal non-COVID times, um, this annual meeting will take place around the AGS meeting. So you can look for that if you're interested in attending in the future. So now let's talk about how to actually think about deprescribing. And there are a few main categories or scenarios when medications can be considered for deprescribing. So the easiest one is when there's a clear harm of the medication. The patient has a side effect, 
you know, experiences, you know, a fall or fracture that's, you know, and you think it's due to the med, that's a clear opportunity um, where the harm might outweigh the benefit. In addition, there are lists of high risk or inappropriate meds, most commonly the beers criteria. Another bucket would be meds with uncertain benefits. And the most common situation that in which this occurs is for patients with multiple chronic conditions who are on polypharmacy, where there's really just not good evidence um, that all of the meds are providing benefits. In addition, um, in palliative care and hospice settings, sometimes the benefits are uncertain. And if there is uh, a change in goals of care, which I know today's case um, is just that, there's a change in goals of care. So that is a time to stop and think about potential deprescribing. And then lastly, one bucket is for prescribing cascade. So if this occurs, um, of course, you'd wanna step in and try to deprescribe. So what is a prescribing cascade? Um, you may have heard of this before, but just to reiterate, it's when a drug is started and it causes a, a side effect that is misinterpreted as a new medical condition for which a subsequent drug is used to treat. Um, so for example, NSAIDs are used, they worsen hypertension, and then an antihypertensive is started. So that's exactly what we don't want to be doing. Um, sometimes these are hard to detect because it's not always easy to, to attribute a drug to a side effect. Um, but if you are able to notice one of these, this is a clear opportunity for deprescribing. So a high level overview of the process of deprescribing. The first step, which sounds way easier than it actually is, is to do a, a thorough med rec. So getting all the meds that the patient's on, including OTC, supplements, et cetera. And then you wanna consider the overall risk of drug-induced harm in this individual patient, um, because that will really um, dictate the intensity of the deprescribing intervention. So for example, somebody who's on five different you know, CNS depressants, that's a much greater potential for drug-induced harm than somebody who's just on you know, an antihistamine. So you wanna consider that kind of composite risk. And then you literally march down each drug and think about whether or not it's, it's ready for deprescribing. And of course, not everything is um, urgent today. So you need to prioritize which ones and in what order you wanna work toward this. And then implement and monitor a drug discontinuation regimen, which requires a lot of communication um, I think oftentimes that's where the challenges come in. So I really like this article by Thompson, um, which was in JAGS last year. And the goal of this article originally was to summarize all the available tools to assist clinicians in deprescribing for frail older adults and those with limited life expectancy. But in doing so, they also um, described the deprescribing process as this continuum in which a clinician would first need kind of a high level instruction instruction on how to approach, so that's step one. You would then need to evaluate the entire medication list, it's a little bit more specific, and lastly, you would need guidance on how to actually deprescribe the drug, so that's kind of the most specific. So the authors in their paper, they use these three steps to categorize the different tools that they found in the literature, but um, I think with a slight adaptation, we can use these steps to think about how you could become a, quote, deprescriber. So the first step that they mentioned is to use a model or framework. Um, and so this is also referred to as kind of a deprescribing mindset, which really requires the shift in thinking away from starting something to think about, is, is there an opportunity here to reduce either the number of drugs or the dose of certain drugs? And so here you're thinking about these high level concepts of goals of care, time to benefit, life expectancy, et cetera. And then you get a little bit more specific and you have your med list. And so here you're, you're kind of maybe screening for certain meds that, that pop up as high risk. So if it's a Beers drug, um, if it's a drug-drug interaction that, that pops up and you begin to prioritize um, which ones you might wanna focus on in the near term versus the short or in versus the long term. Um, and I put own the list here because I think this is basically a, a call to fight against prescribing inertia, you know, because it's so easy to say, oh, well, someone else started this, you know, I'm, I'm not going to touch it. And sometimes that is appropriate, but sometimes, you know, it's, um, it's appropriate to kind of fight against that inertia and to own the list and kind of take control um, from a deprescribing standpoint. 
And then the most detailed step is to actually pick a drug. So, you know, you want to focus on omeprazole today, pick a tool, use an algorithm, use some sort of systematic approach to how you're going to do it with a monitoring plan. So that's just kind of in general from a, a broad sort of high level mindset down to the specifics of how you can view yourself as uh, a deep prescriber. Now this all sounds nice and clear and clean, but of course there are huge barriers um, and I'm sure you could add more to this list, but you know, oftentimes patients have strong beliefs about medications or psychological connections with medications um, that are sometimes hard to even identify, let alone um, modify. There are concerns about adverse drug withdrawal events. So for example, with benzos, we worry about that a lot. Um, so the, the rate of the taper matters um, with reducing the risk of those. Uh, probably the number one barrier is time because in a 15 minute visit, you have competing priorities and there's really not much time to begin these discussions, let alone get buy-in from the patient. So um, one strategy that's being used in both clinical and research settings is to leverage the pharmacist um, to help with some of this work um, and other members of the healthcare team. And then the lack of evidence um, is still a barrier, but it's becoming less of a barrier over time with efforts um, like the USD prescribing network. And then I just wanted to point this out. You know, you might say, well, my patients aren't interested in this. Um, this was a national study where they included these items in a Medicare sample. And I just wanted to point your attention to the top item, which is if my doctor said it was possible, I would be willing to stop one or more of my regular medicines. And you see, you know, 90% of people either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So I think you have a lot of power um, to nudge people toward deprescribing. Um, and so just something to keep in mind. And I mentioned earlier, but communication is really key. Um, and so some things to think about here are taking advantage of opportune moments. You know, not every visit um, is going to be an opportune moment, but maybe, you know, a patient is following up after a hip fracture and they were on a lot of CNS meds going into the hospital. So that could be an opportunity to kind of contextualize their acute event that probably caused them a lot of distress um, and discomfort. It can, it can um, be an opportune moment to, to raise that deprescribing conversation. The importance of priming the pump. So oftentimes this takes a lot of effort. So, you know, maybe today you plant the seed and say, you know, I'm a little concerned about your use of drug X. Um, maybe at the next appointment we can discuss that. So you prime the pump and then you revisit it. Um, that can be an effective strategy. And then I think just realistically, from a feasibility perspective, um, it's really important to keep in mind that stopping omeprazole is way different than stopping oxycodone. And those two de deprescribing approaches will be vastly different and require different um, amounts of time and resources. So I am happy to take some questions or comments or experiences that you all have had with deprescribing in your practice.